So this is a community food systems call on Monday, September 27th, 2021. We have with us uh, a lovely and like super connected and intelligent guest, Ken Meter, uh, who's been doing work on this topic for a really long time. Um, and I think, I think maybe a, a, an easy way to get a, to slide into the topic is, um, what's a way that we can see the world a little bit like you see the world? Well, I'd have to know more about how you see the world to answer that question. I've, I've had the- only... Oh, you don't want to get inside my head. That's really dangerous, <laughs> dangerous territory. I, I didn't say inside your head, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I mean, I, I, I my really main exposure has been a few snippets from Anne and also from listening to the webinar you did on, th on Tuesday last week. So, um, you know, I think, you know, I mean, I think, you know, one thing that I think that you're doing just like I am is that you, you know, my work has done is to really look at what are the system levers that will move the system to a better place in the in the US and global food system. We're, we're certainly asking those questions together. And um, obviously, we're all wrestling with the issue of how to build better market power for farmers. And, um, and I think, um, you know, part of that is clearly in your world and mine, find, finding ways to connect producers and, you know, growers and consumers more directly. Um, and I'm happy to give you some more context for, for this conversation, for, you know, who this group is and where we're coming from. Um, this is part of a larger thing that is not necessarily an entity, more like a hashtag and a, and a movement called Open Global Mind, mm -hmm. um, which started when, uh, by, by happenstance, when lockdown started. Mm -hmm. um, and open global mind is, means a couple things. One of them is open-mindedness. Um, the, the, the one line mission is helping humans make better decisions together. Um, and OGM, open global mind, is not specifically about farming, agriculture, or food, or healthcare, or education, or whatever, but in fact, uh, touches every one of those disciplines in different ways. And, and part of what's interesting is how we explore our way, uh, you know, across those issues, because it turns out that you know all those domains have the same sorts of problems in common. Uh, they just don't necessarily know it. Um, and then another piece of Open Global Mind is inspired by um, uh, blah, blah, blah. so let me just share screen for a second. So this thing over here, which is a mind map called the Brain. Um, I did not create this software, uh, but I was on their first press tour, twenty three and almost 24 years ago now. In December, it'll be 24. And um, this is mind mapping software. You've probably seen mind mapping software. Here's your Crossroads Resource Center. When I click on something, it rotates into the middle and I've connected it under uh, local living economies. I should probably connect it more. And during this call, I will be feeding my brain as we go. Uh, but here's what I have, for example, under local living economies. Now, I've been feeding this by myself for, for these 23 years. You're looking at the same file that I started 23 years ago, and it has 475,000 things in it, like local living economies and you and the Preston model and the local economy solution and so forth, all linked up. But it's just me doing this. And Open Global Mind is like, what if we were all collaborating to create kind of a global brain, like a, a global sense-making apparatus of some sort, and, and that it didn't have to look like this brain software. It, for you, it could look like whatever works well for how you represent what you know and what you care about. Uh, for someone else, it could look like there's a systems diagramming tool called Kumu. Maybe it would look like that. I don't know. And for some people, it might look like wiki pages after wiki pages after wiki pages. And I have a couple of friends who've been doing wikis for 30 years. Um, so anyway, that's, the, that's the, the context you've fallen into. Klaus has been uh, the lead on our sort of food systems project and he is on fire, as you likely know, about fixing stuff, having come out of the food industry, uh, food services, and you know, been in charge of creating restaurants and all sorts of things in, in the food ecosystem, and then becoming kind of painfully aware, and Klaus, forgive me for speaking for you, I'm happy to turn it over to you so you can explain it a little bit more as well, but really becoming painfully aware of how broken the system was, in particular, as we try to switch toward regenerative systems. Uh, with all the different benefits that regeneration offers, not least of which is carbon capture and maybe sort of uh, some help with, with global climate change, that it might be one of the biggest levers we have for, for helping on climate change. Um, Klaus, anything you want to add to that? No, no, just to say that you know, we have been collectively on a journey 
for almost a year now, right? Which uh, you now has taken many twists and turns. And and uh, we I, I posted yesterday this uh, uh, project chart that we ended up with, and then realizing that we uh, will will need some more resources to really transfer that. So it was exciting to see you come on the scene, Ken, because you already have operationalized some, some of the things that we've been talking about. Mm. And, uh, so yeah, that's why we're really interested to listen to you. Sounds great. Um, Anne, do you want to jump in? No, I'll just, um, I'll add, I feel like at this point, I'm like a connective tissue um, in a way, in the sense that like I, I connected with Jerry and Klaus about the work they were doing. And then a, fr a very good friend of mine who's a mutual friend of Ken's connected me. And it was that realization that like, Ken, as we said, has done, has done this operationally and done it in multiple app in multiple aspects, multiple locations across time and space. Um, and I thought, you know, there's just so much value in, in learning from failures and successes in the past. Um, and then, you know, I just did this opportunity to, to connect his experience with the slightly different but still applicable experience that Klaus, myself, and Jerry and others bring. So I am literally just a connective tissue here bringing some folks together uh, who who care about the health of our planet and the health of our people. So love that. Um, anyone else want to jump in just to offer context for where we are as we start? Jordan, do you want to? I see you reaching for the meeting. Hello, dear friends. Yeah. Um, hey, good to see you. No, I I'm good. I'll, I'll um, just listen and debrief. But there's um, Ken, I guess, just uh, there's there's a lot of organizations that are kind of gathering um, at the starting line and desiring to or I guess coming to the awareness you had long ago that we need to move and move with force to get things realigned. And, um, you know, everybody's kind of humbly recognizing that there's people that have given their entire lives to this. So um, hopefully as we begin to talk, we can we can help to align some greater resources and scalability and different things. So just really interested to hear about you and everything you've been doing. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so with that, I'll turn the mic, so to speak, back to you, Ken, and just um, see if, we, if you can help us see a little bit the way you see. Well, sure. Um... Let me let me just start by um, I, I really made my main purpose for today was let you know about the book and the resources that that offers, but I should give you a little personal background to the book as well. Um, my father was born in a farm in uh, in a log house on a farm in Nebraska in 1903 and. Um, he did everything he could to get as far away from agriculture as possible, but he also, in his later years, was really missing the sense of community he had back in the farm, even though farming was so terrible in, in his childhood. And uh, that created a mystery for me that I decided I wanted to unpack. Um, I really got involved in um, a lot of this work because of the Vietnam War and because of realizing that the war against Vietnam was also a war against our communities. Um, because it was taking resources out of solving problems that we had here. And I was lucky to live in Minnesota, where we have um, a very strong cooperative grocery movement and cooperative movement. We have 10% of all the co-op groceries in the country are in Minnesota. And I helped start some cooperative businesses in uh, inner city Minneapolis in the 70s. Uh, that morphed into a career as a journalist. And uh, and that interviews with, with farmers morphed into a, a conversation with scholars and with myself and with research libraries to learn more about the economics that farmers faced. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think in the 1970s, I was able to really encounter the, re the regeneration dialogue, mostly from the Rodale Institute, which was talking about regenerative agriculture at that time. And it's a term I started using when most people um, had no idea what it meant and really did not want to hear the term because it was strange to them. And it's really wonderful to see that term now falling into very general use, although we're a lot of us are still not sure exactly what it means to different people. But um, that's it's a big development in the last 50 years. Um, Could you tell us what it means? <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I, I can tell you what my definition is, but I think that you know there, there's, there's so many uh, different definitions out there. I mean, I, I think the um, what I what, what attracted me to the definition in the 1970s was that um, people talked about an agriculture that could regenerate itself. So essentially, 
the inputs you needed were the inputs that you raised on the farm and the uh, the economic systems you needed to make that work were things you could develop within the community. And it was very much kind of local level grassroots de definition of regenerative. It's a very different model than I hear a lot of people talking about today. But um, to me, the focus is on, you know, the, especially looking, you know, going to organic growers conferences back then when we had 600 people talking about this, it was the idea that you could grow your own inputs, you could actually create fertility on the farm, you could uh, build soil health, and that would help it, help systems balance out. And that, that was the heart of a, not only an agriculture, but as I've gone grown older, a food systems that we need, we deserve to have. So I think that would be my my sort of short answer to that question. But um, you know we've we've been having uh, you know this discussion for <clears throat> several decades, and um, I'm lucky I'm lucky enough to be able to go to the conferences around the country in Cal, you know California the Eco Farm Conference in Wisconsin the Moses Conference, where several thousand people have been gathering every year for decades, trying to um, um, you know wrestle with how to grow food, how to build food systems, how to you know support each other in that process and so on. So I, I have a fairly keen awareness of what I've witnessed in that path. Um, the, you know, the, the chance came up a couple of years ago to start writing a book about this, which is what I call building community food webs. And there are three reasons that I wrote that book. One is that I wanted to um, really document this work I had done in many iterations for decades to really look at how the farm, even the food system and the commodity economy we have draws wealth out of rural America and to a large extent out of urban America as well. Um, and that's a story that's gotten me all around the country working at community level uh, projects, 144 regions and 41 states to date. And it's been a, an analysis that's really been very resonant and I've been able to see how that story plays out in very different locales uh, across the country from Hawaii to South Carolina, to Maine, to Alaska. Um, and, you know, the, the bottom line of that story would, in the book would just be that I'm, I'm tracking in a very conservative tracking $4 trillion being taken out of the rural economy in the last century in, in inflation adjusted dollars. And that compares with the entire value of the U.S. farm sector today of only $3 trillion. So more wealth has been sucked out of the economy than the value of all the farms that are remaining. When you say sucked out, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, paying interest on loans um, that does not get returned back to the community. Um, I mean, buying inputs, for example, seed, which used to be something you was grown in your neighborhood, is now increasingly an output input from outside. Um, obviously, fossil fuels, which are, are seldom um, mined or at least bought, you know, purchased right from a mine in that re in that region. And um, and you know machinery and other other things. I can't track the machinery payments because we uh, we can't. Um, you know, I mean, we don't have data about that. It's actually Jerry. It's actually four trillion, not billion. So. Oh, sorry. Right. Yeah. I was like, I was like trillion. I don't know. Trillion. Yeah, it's trillion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, um, you know that uh, that fundamental analysis of that the economy, the food system we have, as well subsidized as it is, as well supported as policy by as it is, and as well as sort of dominant as is in the global markets, it's drawing wealth away from our communities. And obviously you can't have regenerative communities when most of your wealth is being taken away. And um, I think one of the things that that informs my work is that every time I'm working, I'm trying to really rebuild some capacity in the community where I work. And I'm trying to partner with people in a very egalitarian way. And I'm trying to see my efforts to really leverage their work and to advance their own goals rather than coming in with a sort of outside um, agenda or, or paradigm to, to inflict on people. The second thing the book does is to cover um, case studies of eight really promising, I think really innovative efforts that I've been part of around the country. Uh, one in uh, Montana, first of all, which really emerged out of the farm credit crisis of the 1980s and really represents a lot of learning that we need to go back to because the crisis we had in the 1980s is very similar to the crisis we're facing today with the dismal economics we have and the pandemic and so on. So that's a very good example of 50 years of activity in one state to try to address uh, moving towards more sustainable agriculture and um, more sustainable living profiles. Uh, Hawaii talked about how 
re restore, re returning to traditional cultures was be becoming a very potent way of getting out of the plantation economy, which itself has now collapsed after a very small time in the islands. Uh, the third chapter, or the fourth chapter is Tucson, Arizona, where a food bank is really committing itself, not simply to handing out food to low-income people, but to helping get them engaged in governance of the food bank, in running for office, in starting local business, but really empowerment scenarios. Um, the next chapter is uh, at North Southeast Ohio, Athens, Ohio, where um, a group of young people moved from the East Coast to Ohio because they thought it was a fertile place for communication, or for, for connection. And they um, started what ended up to be a business incubator center with the idea that low-income people would have the opportunity to start businesses to... Um, I'm waving my arms because I'm in a room that has a motion detector. And and I was wondering if you wanted me to stop, so that's it. Yeah, no, I, I, I have subtler ways of, of, of asking you to stop, so. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Keep going. Um, anyway. My apologies. Business, through a business incubator incubators center in I'm sorry food business incubator in, in Athens Ohio people imagined helping low-income people um, start businesses so they could ramp out of poverty by becoming uh, new business business uh, owners uh, with some mixed success next I moved to Northeast Indiana where a group of economic developers has first of all decided that they need to bring immigrants to the a very white community and a very red state because without that workforce, they don't see the, uh, the region surviving. And they gave you food and you know, ethnically identified food and local food is one of the ways they're going to attract immigrants and other people to come live in Northeast Indiana. And they built, with my assistance, a Northeast Indiana Local Food Network, which again is having mixed results. Uh, next, the story goes to Phoenix, Arizona, where um, the uh, official county plans in Phoenix account uh, uh, suggest that the amount of farmland in the in Maricopa County should be reduced to 0.4% of the land base um, in a region where billions of dollars is being spent buying food. And there's an essential conflict because developers can get a tax break by leasing money, leasing land to farmers on favorable, uh, leasing land to farmers. They often do it on favorable terms, but they have the right to pull that land back uh, anytime they want to develop housing or commercial development on it. So. Um, Several of the farms I interviewed, two of the farms have been either threatened with a relocation or had to relocate since I did that chapter alone. And we have not penetrated the discussion in Phoenix to get them to really pay close attention to the need to have food produced in the region if the region itself is going to survive. And there's obviously very tough water issues there as well. Um, but I think one of the tools there was to show network maps that showed the isolation farmers felt. And that was a very... Um, a profound educational moment of its own. Next, we went to go to uh, the book goes to Brighton, Colorado, where a group of um, uh, two farmers started raising the issue of how are we going to protect farmland in a historically strong farming community. And I did some research there, which pointed out that um, even the farms that were there as long as 100 years in that community farming vegetables at a very efficient, high, large scale and exporting food across the country could not afford to buy farmland because it was too expensive. So they were essentially positioning themselves to move to uh, further away um, where they could get less regulation and cheaper land prices in the future. And so that discussion, we basically um, persuaded the city and the county that the only entity that could buy that land, farmland, and you reserve it for agricultural use would be the county and the city themselves because no farmer could do it and no one, you know, no investor was gonna do that simply to protect the land that we, that we knew of. And that's exactly what happened. Um, they, they invested quite a bit of money in buying two, uh, two properties and they hope to get up to 1500 acres over time where they're gonna be protecting that land. And then they use that as a foundation for actually branding the entire community around historic splendid valley based on its agricultural heritage and talking about food as a way of branding the future development they'd like to encourage to the area and the final story comes from dakota county minnesota it's a suburb of the twin cities which has really dedicated itself to creating what i might call a web of green space basically on the on the understanding that wildlife need quarters from the the wood the forests in the county to the rivers and wetlands and they're boarding on the Mississippi River. They were hoping this would help improve water quality in the Minnesota River. And a very dogged long-term process to build 
political support among conservative county commissioners to protect green space, to increase density in some places, to protect green space elsewhere, and to build this web, this network of um, wild areas, which also become recreational areas, which may have made the housing values more um, high, higher and also attracted people to come live in the area. So those are all, you know, they're not the only stories out there, but the ones I thought I had the most purchase to tell briefly and the, uh, the most information and the most connection with. The final part of the book, I'll just very quickly say, uh, really covers some of the general themes that I've experienced in the work that I've done over the last five decades and just some of the ways that you can think about this work on building community self-reliance um, from an abstract perspective. And so uh, you know, that's also full of other lessons and other kind of case studies from around the country. So that's briefly about the book. Um, I think I would just, I mean, um, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll just close by saying, I think that, um, you know, one of the important lessons of my work has been that everywhere I go, I really start by learning the history of the place. And I learn about the, the people who've already taken the, the first steps forward. And I learn about the unique assets that are unique to that community and how to build on those assets. And more importantly, not, not to undermine them. Um, and that also involves learning about the unique liabilities or the um, challenges the community faces too. And, and learning that is really important to really putting your rudder in the right, water in the right way to move forward. Um, I, the book is essentially amounts to a, a critique of the commodity system. And I'm more and more convinced as I do this work, which is not popular with a lot of my farm organization partners, that it's the commodity system itself that really makes uh, a more sustainable regenerative agriculture impossible. And I think this really is a, this book is a testament to the idea that we have to really produce, build connections between farmers and consumers if we're gonna have fair pricing, market power and um, sustainable landscapes. And then um, you know, I, I think the, the final thing I'll say is I was reading a, a Facebook post from a farmer I know in the Midwest who uh, uh, is it actually scale that I consider scaringly large. And he had an investor come to him to say, can we take your model and take it to scale? And he said, it's not scalable if it is replicable. And, um, and I think that's a real, a real interesting theme that I found in, the, in this work, that there's a lot of people. And the, one of the chapters of the book is about really questioning scale and saying there's some advantages in, in large scale. There's also some inflexibility and stasis that comes in when you have large scale systems. And it's also very... Um, um, uh, you know, important to value and keep spaces for the small, for example, any healthy food system has places for you, you new emerging farmers to start on a small acreage and build a business. If it doesn't have that, it will not survive long time, long term. Um, so I, I think some days I'm, I'm like a gold panner in the river, like up to his knees, like swishing around looking for the little shiny nuggets. And I just feel like I, we're, we've dropped into a stream where the nuggets per cubic yard of water are these really dense. Uh, Ken, thank you for, I, I was like, I want to, I'd like to know more about that and that and that. I should probably read, read your book. Um, and I, I've got a bunch, exactly. And I've got a bunch of questions and I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, I don't know if you've read either of these books, The Big Thirst and Cadillac Desert, but your book format reminds me a lot of The Big Thirst, where one chapter is about Las Vegas and how this little city in the middle of nowhere uh, that really doesn't have enough water at all, kept its visible water because the casinos were like, if we don't look like there's abundance here, we're dead. And so everybody turned around and tried to help with gray water recycling and a whole bunch of stuff, basically turning Las Vegas into like the, the, the International Space Station in terms of water kind of, uh, with you know keeping the water uh, local and inside. Another chapter is about Fulton County in Georgia where the, the planners basically were just stupid as their reservoir drained to near empty and they did nothing kind of thing. So, so jumping from, from uh, case to case to case around, each of which highlights different kinds of things and, and uh, brings a lot of, I really like your approach also on sort of local wisdom, local experience, local adaptations. I think that's a, a fabulous way to go about it. Um, and then the water crisis seems to me to be very near to uh, the food system crisis. They're clearly coupled, right, in so many ways. Um, and then Cadillac Desert, because one of, the, one of the many light bulbs that went off in my head about, about, the, about water in the West was that most of the land in the West really like was not meant to be cropland. It's, it's maybe good for grazing, but we then created all these water projects that delivered water to farmers for almost nothing per, per acre foot, uh, which was costing us a whole bunch of money to get to them per acre foot, uh, which was a gigantic subsidy, which created all, all kinds of distortions, right, uh, in, in the world. And I'm... Uh, I, I'm just wondering broadly, 
between the, the distortions in the market, and you were also talking about how the commercial food system, the commodity food system is in fact part of the problem. Are there, are there large scale levers for, for applying at that, at that level? And then I'll, I'll open up for everybody else to jump in with other questions. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm no expert in water issues at all, but, you know, the, the sort of standard argument I hear when I go around the West is that um, the water rights are really terrible, but we cannot legislatively make them better because they're so entrenched historically and the politics were so fractured today. My, um, my kind of thinking about that right now is that for Phoenix, for example, um, the tribes in the Phoenix area sued that many years ago saying that since they were guaranteed the land that they lived on, they should have the water rights as well. And they essentially, they do own the water rights that the city of Phoenix depends upon. And um, they, you know, they're very gracious about interpreting that as we're going to provide Phoenix with water, but they're also saying we clearly own it by treaty. And um, in many ways, I see the most hope for tribes really asserting treaty rights and saying we're going to manage water in a different way and really go back to some of the um, traditional insights that fed life in the past. But um, that's an easier thing to said than done, obviously. Um, legislatively, it just seems like a really messy situation because those imbalances created by the irrigation that you talked about also created power imbalances that make it very difficult to resolve them politically. Um, is there any politician or movement that's actually doing the right thing on these issues? <laughs> well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in water. So I mean, I, no, I, and, I don't, and I don't mean water here. I just mean sort of the, the, the policy levers for the big system, like what's broken the commodity food system, which is more your, more your backyard. Like, like is, is, any, is anybody out there with a policy platform you could like totally get behind because they've, they've framed it right and they've pointed to all the pieces that are broken in the system. They're like, let's do this, even if it sounds impossible to do because everything else you just said. Well, there's several. And I think, I think you're aware of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, which is the group that I hang out with the most. And um, they have um, been um, very sophisticated in their work with the, in DC. And um, they are, um, you know, very well positioned in the dis discussions in Washington from their strategic acumen. They're very well networked with grassroots groups around the country. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that their policies are perfect, um, but also I haven't, I wouldn't say that I've been spending a lot of time um, doing in the policy arena. I've been much more focused on how do we make change at the community level given the stasis in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in the South has been doing cooperative development in the Southern states since the 1970s and a whole cluster of credit unions and cooperative banking and um, cooperative sales of fresh produce. They're very well positioned in the discussion right now with USDA now reassessing itself about its own racism and dealing with blacks uh, and other you know, minorities. Uh, obviously there's been a tr even probably a larger problem with how the US agency has handled tribal entities. Um, and you know, there's, there's uh, on a given issue, there's a whole wealth of very powerful lobbyists and organizers really raising good policy issues. And of course, one of the dilemmas being that it's so sluggish in Washington DC, you end up offering a little partial solution, hoping you can get that through in this, in this term. And then you often don't get it. And then if you are able to uh, uh, get it, you're not really taking this with kind of a broad brush um, that unifies everything. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the $4 billion that USDA announced that they're going to release for various projects like infrastructure projects, like meat processing, like food hubs and so on is a pretty good effort to really say, let's take some big major investments and go after them. And that will be, I assume, released in competitive granting programs like the USDA Community Food Projects, which has been around for 20 years or more, like the um, local, food farmers local, local Farmers Market Promotion Program, the Regional Food Systems Development Program, and other federal programs that have been around a long time and are pretty uh, savvy to what's happening in the trenches. Um, but with this new money, um, we finally have the chance to look at this in a very holistic way and say, okay, here's a, here's a chance to invest in a major way at one time. The downside of that is that um, we have a lot of opportunities out there. And I, I've reviewed proposals for some of these 
programs. And what happens is people who have no idea, no background and no vision and no readiness in the community end up applying for money and spending a lot of time and sometimes getting grants that really work against a community capacity building agenda. Right. And I'm not sure at all that the USDA or the, even the, you know our movement has the the ability to um, you know weed weed out weed out the wheat from the chaff in that way. I mean, the food bank, food hubs inspection is a very good one because most food hubs are are co are cost centers rather than profit centers. But people have been convinced to um, embrace them because it's been made popular by USDA because it's a term that can be sold politically. And um, that's causing a lot of people to spend a lot of millions of dollars nationally on projects that were not as lucrative as they thought and are requiring more important subsidies, much as 20 years at a time. The other group I point to, unfortunately, is, is, is gone, but uh, I mentioned this in the book, but the Community Food Security Coalition was a very well developed effort to provide an umbrella for a lot of grassroots activity around the country. Um, it folded in 2010, but uh, it really was, is responsible for helping me get national visibility. And food security, in their view, is really about making sure everybody has access to healthy food. It's now being called nutritional security, which is, a, which is an improvement, but also very hard to measure. And um, that coalition was a very interesting thing because it came out of a federal um, appropriation that formed both the USDA Community Food Projects and the coalition. And the idea was we needed a, a coalition of members to really keep the program whole over time. Um, and there was a very strong effort to engage low-income people in setting policy and in, uh, in solving their own issues for creating better food systems where they live. Uh, a really wonderful effort, but unfortunately that organization is gone. Thank you. Um, Anne, did you want to jump in? You're muted again. There you go. I think I just want to add some anecdotes of some experiences I've had in the last several weeks as I've started to plug into different groups. Um, one is in the course of my networking, literally across the country with people doing work that I'm, I'm interested in doing, Ken has been quoted back to me probably a half a dozen times. They're like, oh, you should read this report. I'm like, yeah, I know Ken. I, I know he has this report. So like, even if Ken hasn't worked in that area, in, in the case of this one example in Alaska, I think Ken, you worked on a project up there 10 years ago. They're still referencing that work. And I think what that highlights to me is there's not a lot of ongoing investment and in looking at what's going on in these communities. Um, it's done on, a, on a, an intermittent frequency, five years, 10 years, which means you don't have the ability to pivot quickly, um, or you don't have people who are well informed to pivot quickly. So A, it's great to hear Ken quoted back. Um, it gives me confidence um, of what's going on, but it highlights to me that there's more opportunity here for people like Ken to provide this insight um, into these communities. And then I think the second anecdote I wanted to share goes to what um, Ken alluded to with more awareness of the tribal communities and their solutions. I was in a, a conference um, for two days last week where Almost every speaker acknowledged the tribal community land that they operated on and or the community that they worked with. And for, it was just really refreshing and it could have been you know, a gesture um, and not true um, affiliation, but the fact that everyone made a conscious effort to acknowledge the tribal community that lived on the land that they were operating in, it just, it was very reassuring and felt like a, a sort of a, a ground swelling of acknowledgement um, that maybe we will look outside of the traditional boxes of finding solutions. So those are just two things I think I'd like to add that are more like anecdotal experiences um, to align with what Ken has already shared. Thank you, Ann. Yeah. Um, anyone else with questions? Yeah, Ken Klaus, please. Yeah, um, I would like to pick up on this comment of um, scalable versus replicable because that's really what we have been working on, right? Um, we have an understanding that each community is unique. Each community has unique, not just because of soil and climate and water, but also because of the socioeconomic circumstances of any community. So that's, that's at best replicable, you know, because you, you're finding uh, customized solutions. Scalable is a support structure to assist communities to develop you know, the, a, uh, an understanding of their system and the tools and support structures they need and make those available on a scalable level. 
So, so I, I, I really see this difference, right? Replicable, yes, understood, but then there needs to be an overhead structure in place that supports the communities in their attempts to replicate someone else's model. First of all, finding a success model that applies to their particular condition, you now and then have access to resources. The, and, and can what got us excited about your, uh, your, your work is that you have identified uh, replication models. You know? So the question now is how can we bring those to scale so that there is a, a organized concerted effort to reach out to communities and assist them in this process. Does that make sense? Well, I think there actually, I mean, there is a process in most metro areas of some food planning, a food planning council of some kind, or you know, some entity that's trying to coordinate that. Typically they are not well-funded and they are typically going project by project and um, they're coordinating more informally than formally. And most political leaders I know of are thinking only in terms of the next election cycle and not making long-term plans for how do we create the best system for our community over the long haul. Um, there's a, um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, one of the, you know, I think one of the reasons I've had the impact I, I've had is because my work has been very small scale and it's been very mo highly mobile and very flexible and been able to sort of intervene in very discreet ways, a little bit more like an acupuncturist than a medical doctor in terms of looking at the specific nodes or leverage points that would make things better. And, um, I, I think mostly I hear people talk about going to scale as if that's always going to be an answer when in fact it's large scale systems that have got caused the trouble that we have. And um, law, you know, the, the idea of having a sort of well-funded permanent planning capacity and coordinating capacity in each metro region and in many rural and most rural areas is really attractive, but also it's a very, um, you know, it's a very expensive process and it requires a lot of capacity building in every region I've worked so far. And it also requires sustained resources over time, which is very difficult to mount politically right now. So there's, there's some good challenges in doing that, but it's certainly a, a very desirable goal to really be able to create that infrastructure that makes this work better over time. It, it involves tax policy as much as anything. Uh, Tag, please jump in. Who's that for, Jerry? You. Oh, for me, I uh, sounded like Ted. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, here's a, a thought that I've had for a long time, is could we do better with small scale agricultural projects if we combine them with habitat so that people would live on the land that they work and own? Uh, I think of the Italian hill towns mm -hmm. uh, and the way the farm is right outside the back door. Well, there's actually some several immigrant communities who have exactly that vision in their mind when they're moving to the states right now. And there's a, a group of Somali Bantu farmers in Maine that uh, I met with several years ago. And they have now been able to obtain money to purchase a, a, an item of land, a, a plot of land. And the working diagram for their vision was would be to have a cluster of houses clustered together, farmland around them. So they can live in a village more like the way they're, you know, they're they're accustomed to living, and also not be isolated on a farm a mile from everybody else. And um, you know, the Hmong community here in the Twin Cities has had a similar vision, but they're not they're more pursuing a commercial vision right now because of the realities they face. And um, as I argue in the book, I think in some ways uh, to have a healthy food system, we need to go back to sort of an indig indigeneity, which is really a, a matter of people living close to land, sharing insights about what they see happening on the land and learning together and can, you know, giving food to people because they need the food, not because it's a commercial venture. And um, I think we'll have a lot to learn from the indigenous food practices of the, of the tribal nations as we uh, open ourselves more to that as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And you know, in terms of low-income communities now, most of the programming I've seen is dedicated to giving food handouts rather than developing places for people to work, work together, to learn about growing food together, to be, you know, to, to expand their skills in growing food together, because a lot of low-income people have been doing this for decades already anyway. But really supporting that with policy infrastructure and tax policy and 
you know, grant programs and investments that really make that uh, as strong as possible. Um, because I, th I think essentially what you're targeting is that, un you know, unless you're someone who knows how to work the land and knows how to garden and knows those things practically, it's very difficult to learn how to eat well. It's very, very difficult to learn how to um, treat other elements of the food system well. And that's really the core of making things better, I think. And that's why my definition of regeneration is a very kind of primal definition, the sense of being able to produce the, the inputs that make farming possible and food system possible from within the community that you're talking about. Right. One, of the, one of the things I learned about sort of the process of Indian removal was that <clears throat> as we moved um, Native Americans off into smaller and smaller plots of the worst and worst land, um, we would also subdivide that land into plots. And um, any plots that were, then they would send land agents back uh, later and any plots that weren't being used, they would just reclaim. They would be like, no, you're not working the soil. So we get it back. So the reservations were basically chopped up and cut up and taken away piece, piecemeal by land agents. And uh, this is one of 50,000 ways in which we basically, you know, cut away uh, their form of subsistence. But also um, one of my big ahas from reading <clears throat> 1491 and 1493 by Charles Mann and uh, Dark Emu and a, a few other things about Aboriginals is that uh, most natives uh, in continents before colonization uh, managed the landscape together. They didn't have plots of land. So the idea of ownership of a small chunk of land was completely foreign to them and was not what they were doing. And so the changes we've wrought on this entire system are so profound and so hinder sage management of the landscape and the soil and the people on it, <clears throat> that large movements like uh, land trusts or other kinds of things seem to me like maybe they're smart, I don't know. Like, you know, in Patagonia, uh, Yvon Chouinard and, and his, his buddy uh, who passed away, buying up huge tr chunks of land, I don't know what they're doing with it, but it could be that managed well, that could actually be a good thing. But and then uh, uh, Sumit is putting in the, in, the, in the chat here that, you know, Gates is the largest farmland holder in the United States. What is up with that, right? So, yeah. so, so there's, the, there's these gigantic issues swirling around farming uh, that go back my, forever. My, my, my favorite book mm -hmm. about the land issue would be um, The Relentless Business of Treaties by Martin Case, who's a Minnesota writer. And um, it really describes how the treaty process itself was a process of declaring the land alienable for private property. And uh, you know the, the most dramatic thing about that book is that most of the people who signed treaties on the white side were basically signing the treaties with their relatives, with their business partners. And it was a very incestuous system. We would, it would totally not pass any uh, conflict of interest test we might have today. But essentially people were um, signing treaties with the Indians and then acquiring the land because it was now private property instead of being communal property, and then um, selling the land to other settlers at a profit. So that uh, the whole business of speculation was built into the whole settlement system from the get-go. And, uh, and of course, William Cronin also has done some wonderful books about the, uh, the ways that um, tribal people um, took care of the land in New England. And his book, um, uh, Nature's Metropolis, is a wonderful book about how forestry, um, farming, beef ship, cattle shipments, railroad industry, uh, all shape the growth of Colorado, of, of Chicago. It's a really phenomenally, uh, w phenomenally researched and very uh, in-depth critique, and not critique, but kind of a description of how all of that played out in one city. Love that. Um, Doug, did you want to jump in? Uh, yes. Um, in my childhood, uh, growing up, the word farmer had a kind of negative cast to it, which I think still exists. And the word has its origin in fixed rent or fixed lease. So you're paying a part of the crop to lease the land. And the person who did that was a farmer. So it implies from the beginning a kind of class structure that's not so attractive. So I'm wondering if we need to play with that word. Yeah, I mean, you know, and actually the, um, you know, in German, the, the word farmer is close, I'm sure knows it better than I do, but the, it sort of has a connotation of working the land. It's sort of, it's Bauer and someone who's building or was kind of working the land. And so it's, um, uh, it's very true that the farming industry has been very caught up in land rents and, um, you know, who gets money from the farmer's labor. 
Um, what I'm, you know, what I'm excited about now is a lot of my friends who are young emerging farmers are posting on Facebook pictures. You know, one 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 farm family shows pictures of them snuggling with their hogs and really getting down and kind of, uh, you know, uh, playing with the animals and feeling very much kinship with them. And I think that what I'm seeing among some of the emerging farmers, or at least who are privileged enough to do this. There's a real sense of we're farming because we're having a good time and we're connecting with directly with buyers who support us to do that. And um, and I'm you know I, I'm not I mean the word I'm not sure I'm not sure English has a better word than farmer, but if we find one, we should certainly use it. I, I will say the one I, I often use. So I work at a farmer's market and on a farm is grower. I, I do hear a lot about grower, like you know, and, and the way my farmer I work with talks about her plants is kind of like how I talk about my kids. Um, to Ken's point. Um, and I mean, grower, I think has a slightly more positive connotation or at least can be reinterpreted in this context to maybe be about like raising mm -hmm. your plants, growing your plants. Yeah. Although, yeah. although in some farm communities, grower is more of a person who's bigger and more kind of vested in the system and, and you know, distinguishes themselves from a farmers by being larger and being kind of above above being a farmer. So and this is why I value Ken's experience. I only know my farm. He knows a lot of farms. <laughs> I remember being disoriented when I first moved to California. Hi, Ken, a long time ago. Uh, oh, that, Jill. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that people that people I heard people say grower, not farmer. I was from the Northeast. I was used to farmer, and the gr grower was disoriented. And I think you're right, and that it it does it. it to me, it lands like more of a manufacturer than a steward. I like steward a lot. A steward doesn't imply necessarily growing or raising anything, but for me, steward works really well. Stewards of the land. Yeah. Um, and if you ask some people what they grow, they say like, "I grow, I grow soil or grass." And actually, there's animals feeding on the grass, but it's really the you know the cycle around the, well, the soil Wendell, and the grass. Wendell Berry wrote beautifully about this years ago. He said that the, far the farmer grows soil and community, and the food is the byproduct. Yep. Uh, Jordan. Wanted to <laughs> get your sense, Ken, on based on what you're seeing around the country. There's um, there's some there, there's a growing consensus around this need to completely change our the way we produce and consume fee, food as a human species, and there's some time frame in which we need to do that in order to have the best shot at the total regenerative project of our planet, and. And I'm curious in your mind, um, you've, been, you've been working, you, you talked earlier about these little partial solutions that aren't taking the broad butt brush that unifies everything into a total solution that might actually work within the amount of time that we have. So I'm kind of curious from your perspective, what's out there that has the best shot at succeeding at that total broad brush that unifies everything into something that might actually work you know, within this decade and, and how comprehensive in your mind does that need to be? From what I'm hearing from Klaus, there's very small, like sub 5% of, of our food system that's actually local regenerative. And so it seems like it's a total halt, like overhaul that needs to happen within a single decade. And, and I'm, I'm not really seeing that we're on track for that. So do, can you shed any light just on that total project? Well, I think um, you know it's been urgent for the entire time of my career, and I've uh, I've never felt these changes could be made in a single decade. And and you know, and I think mostly because resistance is so strong in um, in the political system we now we we now are coping with, and um, typically big ideas don't get an opportunity to flourish until there's a major crisis where the kind of the obvious prevailing solutions have fallen apart, fallen away. Um, I, I think that the, um, the efforts to build a food system and to really, um, you know, think about food system construction are pretty rare. Even people who talk about systemic answers are still mostly talking about, we like this farm, we like this food business, we like this initiative because that's what people have control over right now. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I get much larger than that discussion, there's very little political support, there's very little money, and there's very little vision to really keep that moving forward in a sustained way. So, um, 
I, I don't, I mean, I don't think that there's a single place out there where there's someone who has the idea and we should just, you know, fund them to make it happen. I think it's happening in thousands of ways around the world in ways that are small and marginalized and um, need higher visibility and much stronger financial resources to, to pull it off. I, I don't see a 10 year timeline being realistic given my background uh, watching change over 50 years. But um, I, um, I think that the fact that you have foundations now saying, how do we build systems rather than how do we fund programs? That's a hopeful sign, but few of them really understand what that means. The fact that we have a food systems partnership in grant at the USDA shows thinking about systems, but again, it doesn't really um, play out in practice very well yet um, because most people are sort of content to support a single firm, a single good person, a single idea rather than really sitting down and you know, building the trust and constructing systems in a sustained way at a local level. And this goes back to the question I was asking you earlier, Ken, which is like, is there a politician or a movement that kind of has the right answers to a lot of these systemic questions, even if the hope of their achieving them is like near zero, but has anybody got that? And so you said, like, not really. And, and now you sort of said it again. And it's just making me really Jones uh, to have at least a policy map for what that could look like. Uh, a, a, you know, a good description of what things one could implement and what, what things one could do uh, to make that all work. Um, let me go to Doug so, and, and Klaus. Yeah, Ken, is you're thinking that climate change might force this time to, uh, uh, to happen more rapidly. Uh, if we start getting breakdowns in the supply chain, uh, local communities are going to demand new ways of doing things. Well, I, I hope it will. Um, you know, I, obviously, um, we've had very strong signals about climate change for decades that we've been ignoring. So our capacity to ignore those is quite high. Uh, the pandemic certainly uh, pushed many communities I work with to think much more carefully about planning for the future of food in their own communities. Uh, I, I'm actually thinking the pandemic is having a stronger impact than the climate change because it's been more immediate to so many more families. And I really feel like we're most vulnerable in terms of, you know, immediately in terms of viruses um, or other illnesses that may break out because of the bad conditions we're living in. But um, I mean, it, it's essentially, you know, obviously young people have really mobilized around climate change in a very effective and wonderful manner. Um, they don't have much purchase politically yet. And we have, you know, hu huge funders trying to prevent the, the, all the nations from really addressing climate change effectively. You have some communities that have gone totally off the grid or have found ways to be carbon neutral in, in the next 20 years at the community level. So you have this whole ferment of activity that's happening wherever it can happen. And, um, you know, I mean, if climate change doesn't scare us, we're gonna be dead, um, but the pandemic may get us first and it scared some of us, but not all of us. And it's also, Cause this reaction that we're also dealing with at the same time. So it's a very, it's a very complex reality we're all coping with. Before I pass the floor to Klaus, um, I think it was Ray Taylor who was briefly on the call who sent me an email uh, earlier today, um, and and gave me a, a an acronym, not an acronym, but a, a, an abbreviation that I hadn't seen before. I'd never heard of multiple breadbasket failure, or that it has a, like MBBF, and I'm like, holy crap, um, because. You know, we're seeing we're seeing already sort of uh, exaggerated weather events and the, the thawing of the tundra and a bunch of other things happening, uh, where what used to grow here doesn't grow here anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, is is that a, just a specific example of how the climate crisis might actually precipitate change? Are there other things in that? I mean, <clears throat> um, it, it also points to really dark scenarios where there isn't enough food to go around. Well, and we're, we're having, I mean, we've, been, we've been had not had enough food to go around in most of the United States for um, as long as I've been alive. Um, and that has not resulted in us making, developing a system to make sure that everybody had enough food. Um, do you, do you agree with the statement that we have enough food, it's just not distributed? Like we, we waste a third of the food, et cetera, et cetera, all those stats, like we're producing enough food to feed everybody. It's just not getting to the people who actually need food or is that wrong? Well, I, I think it's wrong. I mean, I, I think, first of all, the food waste issue was sort of surfaced because it was a softer way to challenge the food system than to try to really go after commodity policy per se. But most farmers are raising raw materials for indus industrial processing. They're not growing food for humans. And um, you know, the amount of food being imported in the United States is rising steadily. We're importing most of our produce right now from Canada and Mexico. 
even though we have very large uh, productive produce farms in the United States. Um, we're, um, and, that, and, that's, and that's why, the, that's why the, uh, the commodity industry is so problematic because um, it's, it's, you know, it's really not raising food for humans. And, and I think we have now built entire metropolitan regions with millions of inhabitants that is assuming that food can be imported and not raised on local farms. And the infrastructure supports very large scale of exporting of food abroad and very large scale importing of food from abroad. And what's really ironic for me is that in Hawaii, Alaska, South Carolina, and Maine, it's the same reality. We are, have communities that are importing 85% of what they eat and exporting 95% of what they produce. And you know um, that's just a massive that again, French system that's paying a lot of, you know, paying a lot of political leaders. That's paying for a lot of chemical industry and machinery industry. And until we sort of um, dismantle that, you know, where there's a good discussion now at USDA about dismantling the monopolies in the food industry, and that's it's way overdue to have that conversation because we've known that for several decades, but I think we're, we're at a time where that will be at least addressed by a democratic administration for the next year or two. If they get anything passed, uh, Congress. Uh, Klaus, the floor is yours. Yeah, on the political front, there is, uh, there is a lot of energy, Pinkry, Coca, I mean, there are a number of bills uh, floating to, uh, um, to, to shift the agricultural system. The big thing, of course, is in the farm bill. So NSAC, you know, the National Sustainability, Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, in partnership with the Sierra Club, Kiss the Grant, and so on, we are pulling together an umbrella structure to, to engage with the Farm Bill. Because the allocations, the, the, crop, the crop insurance program, for example, and the, the, uh, uh, the uh, entire subsidies are going all to the commodity farmer. And they're maintaining you know, a system that is as, as inefficient as the uh, energy system is. So you, you, you see the energy sector still gets billions of dollars in subsidies. Here's the same in the agricultural sector. So th th they, 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 there is a lot of energy in the political process, but as everybody knows, this thing is totally paralyzed. And there are two distinctly different directions that the industry is pushing into. You know, you have this whole Bill Gates and you know, Impossible Meats, Monsanto, by uh, pushing into a direction of taking protein uh, uh, and putting it into, uh, into the lab, basically taking plant-based protein extracts and turning them into meat-like substances. That, that is a perpetuation of an industrial system that, that reduces the harm on nature, but it doesn't change, right? It, it's not regenerative. It simply lowers the amount of damage that's being done. And we're beyond this because we have to now really regenerate. So then there is an effort, and this is what, what we have been working on, which is really spreading uh, across a number of platforms. And this is to assist communities to take ownership of the ecosystem, to take ownership you know, of their water supply, uh, of their biodiversity, and and their and their and their in their the health of the environment, uh, and that starts with food. You know, you have to really get into into food. And the whole notion is that in order to restore soil, you have to you have to apply that at the regional level because soil is unique. You know, uh, uh, the, the types of soil, condition of soil. You're dealing with climate, with water accessibility, with socioeconomics, and so on. That is unique to each community. So there are no top-down solutions possible. So the idea that we can you know, get a bill out there in Washington uh, that somehow that somehow fixes at community level the food system, it's not going to happen, uh, not in a regenerative uh, fashion. So the, the, the system has to be turned upside down to where solutions are coming from the bottom up. But at the same time, you need a support structure. So once we have identified here is what we need in this community, then you have to be able to find access to resources. That's one thing. And then even more important is access to the supply chain. And, and so until, until the industrial uh, agricultural system, the supply chain decides to support these regional and local efforts, 
in a, in a, in a way of we guarantee will buy your product and when you have to change out the crop because you need to you need to you know you're out of water you need to put nitrogen into the soil and things like that that is the that is the the key issue so what we are suggesting is to work within communities where, for example, the local school system, the hospital system, corporate caterers are starting to get, engage at a hyper-local level for sourcing and, 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 and assist <laughs> in rebuilding a supply chain because it's not just a farmer. You, know, you need an aggregator, you need a processor, you need logistics and so on to pull all that together. So that's basically, where where we have been uh, pushing away uh, with with a, a, a across a number of NGOs and a number of attempts, you know, to put this to put this uh, uh, to the test. And I, I, one one uh, a couple of sections of my book that I like would talk about the, the way that farmers have interacted with grocers and what I'm. What I'm experiencing in my consulting practice is that the only grocers that are reliably going to purchase locally are independently owned stores, the um, who who really have the farmers as their constituents and who are really are, have a reason to say we're connecting with the farmers who are around us. Um, there's a very Im important story in the um, book about uh, Whole Foods in Omaha, Nebraska, where. Um, a group of organic farmers decided to supply, uh, asked to supply the Whole Foods store. And there, there was a very supportive buyer, a young woman who was trying to make good things happen at her store. And she was able to get a very good display for the local farms in the middle of the uh, entryway. So every time someone walked in, they were walking by local produce from Iowa farmers across the river. And um, the problem was that as soon as uh, that was well established, her bosses basically told her we need to we, we found another source which is cheaper. We need to cut out the Iowa farms because we have a local, uh, we have a, another supplier that can do it with less cost. Wow. And, and the, um, and you know, that, that person who was the good buyer decided to move on. And the, you know, the store made it clear that they were not being committed to that. And, and essentially, as long as the store is owned by people from distant, distant, uh, distant community who are responsive to shareholders and to cutting costs more than building a strong community, there's really no way that can last over time. And you saw, um, you saw Whole Foods as it was positioning itself to be sold, treat farmers worse even before the sale happened because they wanted to show that their margins were as low as possible to be attractive for sale. And again, that's one of the dilemmas we're trying to go to scale too quickly. And now they're Amazon. Go ahead, go. So that lower price might be a penny. Yeah, or, right. Or a fraction of a cent. I mean, they will move billions of dollars based on tiny differences that are really significant for, for farmers, growers, stewards, but you know, in a different way than for them. So Ken, there's, um, there's a big gap of the story that I want to invite you to speak into. On the one hand, there's efforts like yours, Klaus's and others, and, and, and others um, to, on the ground to to generate and support sensible, um, rooted in place, rooted in relationship systems that actually work. And that's great. And on the other end of the scale, we have Whole Foods, Amazon, Cargill, et cetera, et cetera, that whole story um, uh, with, its, with its interwoven relationships with public policy and taxpayer subsidy and so forth. There's a big lot of gap between those two. Uh, I don't think, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that you think that, that growing pockets of 50 or 100 or 5,000 of these small things shift the big system. What does? What gets us from here to there? What enables not just the proliferating horizontal scale of well-connected community engagements, but what changes the rules of the game? Is that something that you think about much, or is that you figure that's somebody else's job to think about? Well, I, mean, I think I mean I, I, I think about it all the time. Although um, um, I've mostly found that the action is more productive and more fulfilling at the local level because people are self-organizing rather than kind of creating a, a broader structure that's really focused more on imagery and you know political imagery, especially and short-term political cycles, but. You, know, you have, say, Cargill and General Mills investing in um, production of more sustainable grains, and you have, um, you know, you have the Kernza thing, which was mentioned in the webinar last week, um, and you know, those are very positive steps forward. Um, 
but also it's it, it, the success of those depends on making the commodity system more, more responsive to a new perennial grain. And, and it still means farmers are locked into a, a, a commodity system and perhaps locked into trading with Cargill rather than in a system that they have some ownership of. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the policy answer to this right now is that's really screaming right now with the Sustainable Agriculture Coalition is, um, you know, breaking up the monopolies because as long as the monopoly power is held so strongly, there's no answer within that system. It's going to run by its own logic and it will not be re permanently responsive to the needs of people who are trying to feed actual folks in their communities. Um, but you know that that's a tough issue. <laughs> uh, I, I ho certainly hope it succeeds. But it's it's going to be the, you know, if we don't break up the monopolies and have policy that really uh, keeps people small, yeah. um, we will we will basically have we'll make a commodity system a little bit more responsive, a little bit friendlier, and with the face of regeneration, without the reality of it being managed by the people who need to um, run the system. Well, we did break up the monopolies a uh, hundred some odd years ago. I guess we just got to do it again every now and then. So I, I appreciate you raising that. I mean, for, for me, there's two, there's two direct values of the small scale work that you're doing. One is that it's good for the people involved, obviously. It's, you know, actually real benefit for real people. Uh, the other is that it's the proof case that, um, you know, the big guys always say, oh, the little stuff's not possible. Uh, the organic stuff's not possible. The sensitive, the sensitive, sensitive stuff is not possible. It has to be done the way we do it because it's the only way that works. And this gives the lie to that, which is a powerful, powerful force to have, you know, to have examples on the ground that show that. So thank you. Well, thank you, Gillis. It's, it means a lot to hear that from you. After all the years I've been following your work as much as well as I could too. And I, I wanted to tell a quick, a quick story about this. Um, the, um, oh, if I can remember it now. Um, well, I'll, I'll have to come back to it later. Well, for people who wonder what we're chatting about, Ken and I met like uh, half a hundred years ago um, when I was at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and he was doing this work then. And um, I'm just really impressed with how well, you, how, how deeply and thoroughly you've stuck with it. Thank you. Well, well, thank you for the inspiration you gave me back in those days as well and the, and the way you stuck with what you do. Um, you know, the, you know, the um, uh, Alfonso Morales is one of the people who, um, um, did a blurb on my book in the back, and he, he has a book out, which I think is really interesting, but he, um, it's, it's quoted in the book too, but he said, you can't build communities solely by cutting margins. And I think that's a really wonderful way to think about this, because basically, as long as the economic discussion is about how do we reduce costs, uh, you know, you can, you can build successful businesses that way, and you can compete with your other businesses that way, but um, this, uh, this idea that you can somehow build community or build resilient communities or build res regenerative communities out of that is just really a fallacy. So what does it take to build regenerative communities? What, what are the underpinnings? What are the infrastructures, superstructures, other sorts of things that are needed? Well, um, I mean, I think, you know, I, I hope hopefully Crossroads Resource Center becomes a part of the infrastructure that helps this to happen. Um, the, um, you know, I think I, I see this as a process of self-organization. If you look at this from a systemic perspective, um, you look for self people to self-organize answers that are suitable to their place and time, given the unique assets of their community and the limitations and obstacles they face. And it's, um, you know, and that's really the promise of democracy is that we self-organize to make our lives better for the broader good. Um, and that means um, self you know, supporting self-organizing. At least that's what it says on the box top of democracy, right? I mean, on the box top, yes. Uh, you know, of course, Europe had, you know, the, Europe, the European Union has a lot of flaws, but they do have this concept of subsidiarity where you basically try to vest decision-making power at the local, local level as much as possible. Uh, so that local people can make the decisions they need to make for their own lives. And then you have higher level policies at the municipal level or the county level or regional or um, European level, which shape the framework that allows those policies to flourish. Um, very thick, bureaucratically right now, I'm not saying it's a model policy, but the concept of subsidiarity is something we barely talk about in this country. And I think that would be a really essential part of a, any regenerative a paradigm. Um, I would think that in terms of 
fostering community activity with serious resources so people aren't spending two thirds of their time raising money for the next program. Um, uh, one, one thing I've talked, mentioned to Anna in a conversation this week, we have thousands of food corps volunteers all around the country who are getting paid minimum wage and they're doing most of the difficult work. I mean, the trivial thing would be to leverage what they earn with you know, another 50% of what, they, another a double what they earn and make sure, make sure they have living wage jobs so they can keep doing that over time but also have uh, long-term operational expenses for groups that are formed, that are diversely representative, that really include people of color with a strong voice, that include low-income people with a strong voice, and are really um, addressing long-term food planning in a very sustained way where they live. Um, that would be the policy infrastructure I'd like to see. Um, we don't have that with the USDA now. And, and, and we also have to adopt policies, like I said, to break up monopolies and break up the uh, institutions and the political systems that really frustrate that self-organizing activity that really allows us to do systemic work, moving the levers of change we see as they change over time in each community where we're working. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a, a brief, brief question? Is there, a, is there some kind of solution to the very difficult traveling salesman like problem of what to grow where and when given commodity market pricing given uh, all the different variables associated with with what's happening because some crops take a long lead time uh, you know some trees take years to mature etc cetera, etc cetera. and then there, there's these crazy global markets where if, if all of a sudden most of asia decides to build shrimp farms suddenly the price of shrimp plunges to nearly nothing and then most of them many of them are underwater for example so uh, literally and figuratively. Um, so uh, is anybody working at the systems level to try to even out the flows, make it so that farmers can actually choose wisely what to do? Well, or is it just like, hey, let's roll the dice this season? And for, first thing I'd say is we're all working at the systems level because we're all feeling, we're all facing systems. <laughs> and, uh, and there's no like single global systems level that we can sort of tap into. It's really a, a nested series of, global to very, very local to hyper local that are all systems all changing rapidly and all kind of throwing us surprises on a weekly basis. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons that uh, policy set in Washington, D.C. seldom works, because how do you write a policy that works for Maine as well as Arizona? It, you know, this, this is very, 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 it's really an impossible task. Um, the, um, you know, but the, the, the key is obviously to have resources in the locale that stay in the locale that allow people to invest in what they understand to be an answer. Um, at some level in the global trade thing, and again, we've been arguing this in the world trade talks for, for decades as well, that we need to have the ability to protect our boundaries. And uh, I don't mean in terms of building a wall around the country, but um, you know, there's a becoming a discussion at the World Trade Organization, which I'm not close to, but I'm hearing some signals of it, which that you know, nations should be free to set their own food policies and that the commodity policy, which is global, should have less regulation and, and should be less, uh, you know, should be more about what we call free trade, but that basically every, every country, and I would guess, I would argue every bioregion has the responsibility and the need to have a boundary around itself so it can insulate itself from global pressures where people step in and do something too rapidly, too big that undermines my work in, you know, one part of the country or one part of the world. Thank you. Uh, Jordan and Klaus? You want to go, Chad? Sure, sure. So I I come from a, a different different background um, in that I've spent a lot of my career building things, and and so when you are building a, a roadway or a dam or one of those things, you have a you have an intention, and you have a set of existing conditions, and you have a time frame and a set of constraints in which you have to transform from what is to the different intention, and I'm I'm really concerned. I'm really hopeful as I as I get further into these conversations to hear about the the tremendous number of heroic good people like the thousands of food corps volunteers you just you just mentioned and your work Ken. I'm also a little bit concerned that we're in a a a mode where we can recognize that what got us here that no additional amount of doing that will cause the transformation that we're talking about within the amount of time that we have to get it done before my daughter and her children are suffering in the dystopia that we'd all like to prevent. And so it, 
it seems like it seems like there's growing awareness that any idea that there will be any political solution to this or any movement of Gates Foundation or or the, the Cargill's doing more sustainable things or big policy shifts to break up the monopolies like those things aren't going to happen in the amount of time that we have. And so I guess the, the other hypothesis is that we need to do something like what we're all talking about, but we need to completely take, take responsibility for building it ourselves. And it probably needs to be a combination of the pieces of it that we're all seeing. It, it seems like every individual, like I, I think everybody's aware that the that this is a process of relocalizing and recomplexifying all the systems because that's the only regenerative pattern that there can be is ultimately the restoration of that individual and local sovereignty. And so if you if you imagine that and that that if that only happened in one out of 195 nations in this decade or this 20 years, it wouldn't matter because the the whole living systems connected. So it's like, okay, well, we have to, we have to completely change the patterns of production and consumption in millions of different locales around the world simultaneously within 10 to 20 years. And we can't rely on any politicians or any elements of the existing corporate, religious, or political structures to get it done. So it can only come through the, the individual sovereign action of individual and local communities. However, what we're seeing in all these places is that when individuals wake up and they realize this, they all lack the resources and the infrastructure and the ideas and the training and the capacity to be able to do it on their own. So I guess this is what Klaus was saying a little bit earlier was it, it seems really apparent that there's a need to think through the the infrastructure. It's like if, if it's each individual's responsibility to transform their individual and local system, it's our job collectively to create those ladders to success. Um, and so it, just one, I guess the, the hypothesis that some of us are coming to is we need to create a massive and widespread international movement of individuals who are going through some kind of a, a educational and orientational experience to wake up to the realities that we're, we're fundamentally accelerating with technology the rate that we're applying destructive patterns and that we need to individually change the way we produce and consume in order to reverse those patterns and start modeling new patterns. And there needs to be the creation of some, some very sophisticated infrastructure so that any individual or local community can go through kind of the, the mapping processes like Ken and, and Klaus have been talking about to go in and do their, be empowered to self-organize and do their own individual local assessments. But then based on the results of those short-term blueprints being connected up by the global community to the resources they need. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, it, it, and I guess my hypothesis is it's the people on this phone call that need to somehow come together and get that done. We've all got a lot of great starting points. Ken's got a lot of examples. We've got legal infrastructure and organizational infrastructure and people. We've got technological platforms built to, to empower people to learn together and implement their own self-organized local instances of the patterns of success that they find that might be applicable. Um, and I'm just, I'm concerned that we're all looking for the organization that's going to do that. It's not out there and, and we're going to need to do that if we're going to succeed. Yeah, that's if why I, I like Klaus's ideas. Yeah. If I may just pile on, on, okay. uh, on this, I mean, I've given up you know, some time back and, and I'm very engaged in the political process with business climate leaders and citizen climate lobby, and I'm actively meeting the senators and Congress people and so on. And you realize that this is not going to happen, right? I mean, this, this is going to take way too much time. But can you wish exactly. just saying that what has to happen is, a, is the development of networks, people self-organizing, right? And just as yes. Jordan said right now, this brings us back to the replicable versus scalable the idea here 
replicable, totally realize that each community has unique needs. At the same time, we can also see that there is a great hunger in, in particularly the younger generation to have meaningful change happen. So it takes a multi-pronged outreach uh, to educate participants in the market, to, to help them understand where the trigger points are and the leverage points are, but then provide resources, training, and, and uh, uh, advice, you know, expertise for communities to, to develop here. And much of that is not so much technical as it is socioeconomic, because you have to have people understand that in your community, your local zoning laws, your regulatory frames that you set up in your community are preventing us from, from implementing vital changes that could, that could easily lead us to adaptations that we, that we can't even fathom right now. We can't sit back and wait for some solution from Washington. It's not going to happen. So it has to be bottom up. Everything we need to do, we know. Your book basically outlines it. We know what needs to be done. So it's now a matter of, of mustering the energy, you know, the will. And, and, and I'm on the same page with Jordan. We are, you know, last call here. We, we can't miss another growing season because the industrial agriculture ripping open the entire, all of the soil, you know, letting the carbon steam out of the soil, uh, uh, screwing up the, the uh, entire water cycle on a planetary level, um, we don't have a lot of time to fix that. You know, there are no 10, 20 years going as we are right now without leading this to a shipwreck. You know, so we need to mobilize and, and I know that's, I mean, my gosh, I spent 40 years in corporate, uh, 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 in the corporate world. The idea of mobilizing, you know, even five years ago, I would have thought, you no, know, you have lost your marbles here, <laughs> but, you know, but we need to mobilize. I mean, we absolutely uh, 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 need to muster the will and the energy to engage here at a serious level because we're in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. um, two things before passing the mic to, to Gil. One is, um, I may need to watch some cute cat videos at the end of this call just to like bring spirits back up because this is just, uh, it's heavy, it's, it's hard. And then second, Ken, I think you were about to jump in. I was going to ask if you, uh, if you wanted to jump in because we're getting near the end of our, our call time. Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, I mean, um, resources have to be mobilized, but there are people all over the world doing this and they have been doing it for decades. And there are tribal people in remote places that have been raising crops for themselves or bringing quinoa back or bringing uh, heritage pot potatoes back. And there are people in Alaska who are bringing back traditional ways of raising potatoes that are, date back you know, tens of uh, 14,000 years, perhaps. Um, it's not that we have to sort of start from scratch. We, uh, mostly, none of this is visible in the media. None of this is visible to the political systems. And it's all under-resourced because of this extraction of wealth that my book describes. And it's really more a matter of knowing what's happening out there, intervening in ways that are appropriate to that and supportive of people who have taken those steps, having power over their own work and not simply coming in with a model and sort of dominating the, that discussion because someone has money or someone has, has political access. That's the challenge, I think. And uh, that's why the conversation about mobilization makes me nervous because it's being mobilized and it's, it's, uh, it's underway already all over the world. And it's more a matter of sort of untapping that self-organizing and giving it resource that, that is really the issue to my, in my thinking. And then, and then once we've done that, then we have to talk, those people will develop some structures that are pretty sensible to themselves. And also very locally adaptable because this, this emergent thing that's happening all over the place is very nicely adaptable locally. If, if, we, if we allow it the freedom and the, the elbow room to adapt. I mean, in many cases, there's re legal restrictions for doing a bunch of things or uh, farmers are in debt so that they actually don't have a lot of options for what to do or name, name a restriction. But if we can figure out how to loosen their bonds, uh, a lot of local activities might actually get somewhere. Um, Gil? You need to wave the magic mute wand. There you go. Is that amazing? See? Cool. I like it. Cool. Um, I, I posted a little further up in the chat, uh, sort of flippantly, that maybe it's time to, for us to reread us in Murray Bookchin, but I'm taking myself even more seriously listening to Klaus. 
uh, and Ken here. Uh, for people who are not familiar with him, check him out. Uh, 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 anarchist, ecological writer, profound critic, one of the source uh, fountains for Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, and Jerry, of course, has him in there. Oh, hang on, you've taken over my screen, so I can't read something. Oh, sorry. Um, um, Murray was also the, one of the source fountains for the Kurdish anarchist resistance um, that is not well known in the United States, but there was actually an anarchist sub-nation, uh, uh, ecologically oriented feminist and fierce, uh, sacrificed by President Obama. Uh, when he didn't uh, deal with Assad, they were wiped out when the U.S. was 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 with uh, support was withdrawn. Um, in in Murray's book, The Next Revolution, an article called "The Ecological Crisis and the Need to Remake Society," uh, he argues that the most fundamental message that social ecology—that was his term of art that he used—that social ecology advances is that the very idea of dominating nature stems from the domination of human by human. For an ecological society to develop first, the interhuman domination must be eradicated. Capitalism and its alter ego state socialism have brought all the historic problems of domination to a head. And the market economy, if it's not stopped, will succeed in destroying our natural environment as a result of its grow or die ideology. So aside from the, you know, the, the, the flag waving of all that, uh, what there is in his work and in the communities that have built on that work is very real practical examples on the ground of the kind of voluntary collaborative coordination uh, that Ken and Klaus and others have been talking about. And I think we would do well to dive back into that. Um, Thanks, Gil. I remember long ago uh, deciding to read up on these anarchists, crazy anarchist people. And so I picked up a book by Kropotkin. And I'm like, oh, good. He's, he's like a crazy, crazy anarchist, right? And I read the book and like the first half of the book is all about cooperation in nature, how termites cooperate, how wolves cooperate. And I'm like, ooh, this guy's really frightening. Um, frightening why? Okay. He wasn't frightening at all. He was like totally talking about really sensible stuff. It was like, uh, separately, one of my favorite books in the world is The Great Transformation by Carl Polanyi. Yeah. And at one point I read a refutation, sort of it was a critique of the book uh, by Murray Rothbard, who's the head of the Mises Institute, which should give you a clue. And I read Rothbart's letter about Polanyi's book. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Rothbart commits every one of the sins he's accusing Polanyi of committing, none of which are committed by Polanyi. And I realized that this letter by Rothbart is basically waving to his followers to say, don't even go read this evil, vile, filthy thing. It's dangerous to you. Don't touch it. Because if you actually open it and read it, you'll be like, oh, this is pretty sensible. He's not trying to get us to go back to the noble savage. He's trying to say, hey, look what shit capitalism brought and industrialism brought when it started. And it it's totally makes sense. But it, uh, these works have been demonized extremely effectively the way that democratic socialism is being demonized this very moment very effectively. It's especially demonized by Mies and his folks because if you come, to, if, if you, if you come forward with a libertarian impulse, which is who Mies speaks to, you have Murray talking about the same, sort of the same sort of libertarian human freedom voluntary association impulse, but taking it in a co collaborative rather than an indiv individualistic direction. See, if only we could have a cage match between Murray and, and uh, me. Mises and all those, yeah, that'd, be, that'd be entertaining and everybody would learn a lot. Well, you must have some holographic uh, WWF producers in your-, in your and, and we've got like GAN algorithms and GPT-3 that could reconstitute their writings, right? So this, this could work. We could just haul some modern technology out and do a cage match. Well, I think I've decided on this call to organize a reading group. Um, and part of what I'm hoping OGM can do is weave some of these things together. And I realize that this is like a bunch, it's like a hairball inside a hairball next to a thorny thicket of twine. Um, but if we can make our way through it, making some sense together, I think we can actually piece together some of these arguments so that everybody doesn't have to read all of Bookchin, for example, but rather we can make use of what, what he showed up with and the eco-feminists and uh, native practitioners and Tyson Yungaporta and kind of bring it together into a, into understandable, digestible um, narratives that people can pick up and go, oh, I'll have what they're having. Um, it, uh, Ken, it appears that um, you are going to have the last word on this call, unless someone else wants it. But still, uh, I'd like to pass the mic back to you, so to speak, because this has been really fascinating. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you've, uh, you've been with us here. Well, it's um, it's wonderful to um, connect with all of you, and thank you for taking time to to, to listen to that. So I guess my last word is, would just be that I hope some of you will read the book and, and spread the word around because I think it is a valuable way to kind of um, both 
have some histo stories for inspiration, uh, but also some ideas for how to do this work in the most effective way. And uh, I look forward to some other conversations down the road as we have a chance. Thank you, same here, same here. Um, Gil, is that you raising your hand again? Nope. Okay, that's from before. Um, well, we're still not quite at the half. Anybody else want to chime in and last word and put a bow on this? Dan? I'll just say I'm just I really want to extend my appreciation that everyone made the time um, to listen to Ken. I think I was really grateful to have been introduced to him and to have read his book. Um, it's just it's been part of this journey. Um, and I think that's the one thing I would say I've really appreciated is the folks who are working in this space really want to lift anybody up who wants to work in this space and their willingness to lean in and collaborate um, and help bring people along with what's been done and bring you with them as they move forward. It's just, it's a really positive community. Um, I have yet to come across anybody who has not been that way. Um, and Ken, I think exemplifies that. Um, so just, I really appreciate him making the time and appreciate you all making the time to, to you know, to, to talk with him and listen. Um, along those lines, Ken, any recommendations for where we can join conversations, participate, uh, learn more, that kind of thing? Um, I mean, I think NSAC is probably a pretty good place to, to plug in as far as that goes. And uh, Federation of Southern Co-ops is having a webinar pretty soon about cooperation um, because they're one of the uh, pioneers of cooperation. Uh, I, I, one, one, one final story I wanted to pass on too. I was thinking about quinoa as, as I mentioned that. And I got a contact from some people in Central America who were trying to raise quinoa and they they basically were told that we will invest in you if you pull the warehouse to export the quinoa, but not if you want to feed people who live in your community. And that's the sort of nexus of where we are. People all over trying to do that and just finding the obstacles are kind of this you know, bureaucratic normal thinking. And uh, that's what we have to cut through. Crazy. We live in crazy times. May we all survive them and may our children's children have a better world than we do. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. I will post this call on YouTube and send the link out and we'll lather, rinse, repeat. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.